Hey, Nancy, how's it going? Hey, Matt, how you doing? So uh, um, I, I discovered you like a year ago when you were doing um, some Reason stuff on Antifa, and I totally want to get yeah. into that. But you made an announcement today that you were just telling me about. <laughs> what have you decided? Well, you know, I haven't been as panicky, um, I think, throughout the pandemic. I basically, you know, I traveled back and forth um, for Reason to Portland five times to report. So I've been on planes the whole time. I've been back and forth to Mexico twice in the past two months. And, you know, I wore a mask and was precautionary, but I just felt like, you know, that sort of living your life throughout all this also sort of counts for something. Um, there's a big chasm between, you know, never leaving your house and spitting on people in Walmart. So I am one of those normal people. I just haven't been panicky about it. I've been tested a bunch. I've had my first shot and uh, I'm not wearing a mask anymore. I'm just not. I mean, I'm not going to make people super uncomfortable. I have no desire to do that. But I walked, I live in Chinatown, went to lunch, walked to the restaurant, walked back. I just didn't. We ate outside. No. Yeah. Done. Yeah. So. Yeah, like, um, I, I live on Capitol Hill, just a couple blocks from the Capitol. And the dogma with which people wear multiple masks while walking outside, where there's plenty of room to socially distance, I, it strikes me that we've somehow passed the precaution and and this phase and, and gotten into some sort of religious thing or something, right? Well, you know, I think people, uh, let, let's first say there is conflicting information and not everybody is like media heads like we are and thinking we're, you know, reading uh, what is salient right now. Um, and people are afraid. And then people also become quite wedded to um, the idea that they're doing the right thing. They're being the good people. And I understand that. But the fact is, it's all good news. As a friend of mine said on a podcast, have you heard the good news? It's like, yes. So let's let's go with that good news. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I think we really are, are, I think we're on the other side of things in a lot of ways. So could be yeah. wrong. The, the sort of dehumanization of it, and I, I want to move on to, to, to other things, but I was thinking about this the other day, the way that we behave around each other, um, it's almost as if everybody's the enemy because that person, you don't know what they've done or what they didn't do, have they behaved responsibly. And I notice when you're walking past the street, um, uh, other people, they, they don't look you in the eye anymore. Um, there's no like, there's no like human, like, Hey, how's it going? Or, or a smile. And, and I worry about that. Like, I, I feel like with all this other stuff going on, I feel like, um, this, this sort of culture of distrust is is kind of a toxic and dangerous thing right now. It's funny because I've had sort of the opposite experience. I've noticed it particularly in the past month. I tend to like to talk to people and say good morning and, and smile at people. And I've noticed, and of course you can really only see people's eyes, right? But I've noticed that everybody is pretty communicative. They're like, you smile at them with your eyes and they're like, you know, they, they kind of want to be part of it too. So maybe we're coming out of that part too, of, of being afraid and maybe distrustful. Like, where are you? Did you eat inside somewhere? So onward. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. I'm an awkward, introverted libertarian and I desperately want to be around people again. So it's, it's time. Come on. It's totally time. <laughs> you're in, uh, you're in New York city. I am. Yeah. Okay, and I, I and I read this uh, I read this piece that you wrote it in Tablet, uh, uh, Portlandization, which is I guess the next phase of Californication, where <laughs> Californians came to Oregon and fucked up everything, and and now um, and you wrote this piece and it's I, I learned a lot about you I've cyber stalked you for a couple hours this afternoon, Aww. <laughs> but, but it, it, it really, it resonated with me. Like you, you spent a substantial amount of your, um, life in Portland with your mm -hmm. husband. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into that, that personal story about kind of what drove you back to New York city. Mm -hmm. But I always used to tell all, and particularly my conservative friends would get freaked out about it, but Portland was always like my favorite place to hang out. Um, it, I, I love the music scene and the beer scene and the, the food scene and it's in, in one of the most beautiful places in the world. And like, like, how do you screw that up? And, and I, I wasn't going as much by the time Antifa showed up and I Googled this, apparently they showed up in 2007, but like, 
talk about talk about the evolution of of when you got there, when you got there, and 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 what turned it into this swirling cesspool of of violence and and hate. I, I will. Uh, the first thing I'll do. So that piece, um, which they called uh, the you know, Portlandization, it could happen to a city near you or your city. Um, it was originally called Good Luck Portland because I was sort of ripping up my roots and um, I lived there from 2004 to 2019. So that piece published in summer of 2019. And I actually just wrote, it's not the same kind of piece, but it's a big, long 5,000 word feature for a reason, which is in the May issue, which is called um, The Dream of the 90s Died in Portland. So let's um, let's talk about what happened. So we moved up there in 2004. My husband was originally from there. We were living in LA. And this is a direct quote. He said, honey, it's not the horrible, depressing city it was when I grew up there in the 70s, you know, when there was like the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and his followers in their sunset colored clothing and people were junkies on the street. And it was quite beautiful. Beautiful. He brought me in May. It was Planet of the Plants. It was really beautiful. Now I'm a big city girl. I'm a New York City girl. Felt a little small to me, but you know what? We bought a house. He started a business. My daughter went to high school there. And it was, you know, it was the city was growing. When we first got there, it was very, very Portland, Portland, Portland. Then all of a sudden, like 2009, you start hearing people speaking German or Japanese, and people were like coming from other parts because they're like, wow, interesting incubator here. It's beautiful. It's affordable. People are nice. I can start a business for like a tenth of the price it would cost me in Chicago. So I'm going to do it. And things, it also has this, um, it, it has this ethos, like we're going to live green. Um, it's a pretty progressive city. And I use that more in like the older fashion sense of the world. It's very democratic. And this really spoke to a lot of young people. It's like, wow, I can go, I can go and, and, and create the world I want to live in. So a lot of young people came. So young people come and a lot of them do really cool things. But what happens? Like you get a lot of big influx of people. Rents go up. Not as many jobs. Oh, but wait a minute. I thought I could just like work part time as a barista and raise chickens and smoke pot and play in a band. And I'll have this great life and create this world. Well, what didn't kind of work out. I wrote a piece in 2010 for the Oregonian called um, Is Portland the New Neverland? Because people were coming here thinking that that Portland was going to deliver their dreams. Well, by about 2015, it was pretty evident that was not going to happen. And I think you had a lot of slightly disillusioned, um, somewhat bitter people that were looking, that were looking to make a better world. And God damn it, what's standing in my way? Well, you know, you're going to strike out at the people that are closest to you. You're not going to strike out. I mean, they wanted to strike out at Donald Trump, but he's all the way in Washington. What are you going to, there's no satisfaction in just yelling at CNN, right? So it's like, maybe it's the police. Maybe it's your landlord. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's all these people that have power and you should have power. And so this, it's sort of became an identity, right? The identity that we're going to make Portland a more beautiful, we're going to make it a more equitable place. We're going to fight for justice. Then you had Trump, and of course, everybody was losing their mind in Portland because they were so anti-Trump. And then you had the killing of George Floyd. And um, everything exploded. And um, the anger that had sort of been building for a long time, or resentment, whatever you want to call it, became an identity in and of itself. And we saw that play out. I mean, we're still, we're still seeing it play out. So that's uh that's the uh the five cent version of um what happened to Portland. Yeah, and like in terms of the the violence that that really I mean at least nationally we all started to notice it after Trump got elected. I think mm -hmm. I think that I think that culture and certainly Antifa precedes that significantly. But um it didn't stop with the election of Joe Biden. You just you just mm. wrote a piece I think for for reason, right? About about the you know the the rage yes. goes on. Yes, I was there. So I covered um, I covered the situation on the ground all summer and then through the fall uh, for a reason. It was great opportunity. I'm very grateful that they wanted me there. Um, and before Biden was elected, people kept saying to me, OK, Nancy, what happens? You know, what happens is Trump is reelected. And I was like, well, it'll put some more gas in their tank for sure. Right. What happens is are they going to be happy? Because, you know, Biden's their guy. I'm like, you are high. OK, if you think that these folks are like for the Democrats, they want no government. And here's and, and I and I use that not because people have said that to me and I and I and I shouldn't be glib when I say that what they know how to do. And I've written this many times. They are very they're like young and so much 
energy and they love to tear shit up, man. It's like fucking stuff up is fun. First of all, it's COVID. You're not supposed to leave the house. Maybe you don't have a job. You're not in school. But you know what? You can go out every night, fuck shit up, and save the world, ostensibly. So that's what they did. So I actually was there um, for the election. And I went out the night after the election. And I was marching with a lot of the Black Bloc, which is, you know, sort of the more violent arm of Antifa. But really, Matt, I think a lot of these kids, they are LARPing, you know, live action role playing. They're putting this stuff on. It's an opportunity to get outside. And it was so crazily violent. They just marched through downtown and, you know, broke windows of, of, of literally this one store called Wild Fang, which specializes in like genderless clothing. And there's a there's a slogan of Martin Luther King in the window, like you can only defeat hate with love or something like that. And they're just breaking the windows. Well, why? Because that's how, what they know how to do. They don't know how to build anything yet. They just know how to, to mess stuff up. And it was the first time that the governor, who has had really wanted to blame all the violence on, you know, it was the feds or it was right wingers. It was the first time the governor came out and said, we will not stand for this violence left, right, or center. Um, because it is basically, I mean, the violence that we've seen on the streets for 200 nights running, now it's not every night, is from the left. I mean, people can fight me on this, but I'm sorry, I was there in the middle of it, and these are the black block kids um, that are that are setting the police stations on fire and breaking windows and walking past people's houses in the middle of the night with laser lights saying, get up, get up, get up, motherfucker, get up. These are not now. It's not that right-wing groups don't roll through town and they 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 mix it up. They do. And that's a, you know, that's a bit of certainly to a liberal porn loaner. It's a more scary thing because, you know, these guys come, they're standing in the back of pickups, they're open carrying. I mean, they're, they don't look like the characters out of Portlandia. Okay. And they're, it's very easy to identify them, but they are not the people on the ground. They might be fighting Antifa sometimes, but they are not the people on the ground causing the violence. No way. So, so like, uh, um, a lot, a lot of us libertarians have have made the distinction between sort of the the founders and the ideology of Black Lives Matter Inc. versus people that are gathering and protesting um, for the righteous cause of of race based police violence. and And it strikes me that there's a there's two agendas there. One which is 100% laudable and reasonable. And the other, which is is radical and and from my perspective, uh, dangerous. Um, it sounds like from what you're saying that Antifa is the same thing because I, you know, there's this book uh, you've you've probably read it called the Antifa Handbook um, by some professor, and I'll find his name in a second. But you know, the Antifa Handbook and the history of Antifa is not just anti-fascist; it's it's explicitly Marxist. And it's mm -hmm. not just um, a protest movement. It's it's sort of an explicitly violent strategy to disrupt the status quo in a in a way that would fit right into to Marx's arc of history. Like he's trying to they're trying to jar people out of their late stage capitalist mentality. But from what you saw on the ground, um, is is the typical kid dressed in black smashing windows? Is he? ideologically motivated or is he just part of a thing that gives his life purpose? I think it's the latter, um, though, you know, they are all sort of, you know, dressing all in black and covering their, ide their identity. So I can't really say, you know, who is more dedicated than another one. I will say, you know, um, one thing that I found the more liberal media had a really hard time um, understanding was, you know, you had at one point, like there was a march of 10,000 people in Portland uh, a couple of days after George Floyd was killed. And these were what you would call peaceful protesters, no doubt. I mean, families and kids and strollers and like, yes, please go out and do this. Absolutely. But what happened? They went home and you had, I don't know, a hundred or so. I wasn't actually there that night that broke into the police station, set a fire, destroyed the furniture, People were locked in the basement, police employees. I wrote about a woman that was locked in the basement there. So it's like, but they were not allowed, the more liberal media was like, well, they didn't want to say that these people were violent or, or at all, because then they thought you were tarring the whole peaceful protest movement. I'm like, 
why is it so hard to understand that you've got, you know, 9,900 people that are peaceful and 100 that are not? But to kind of get back more specifically to your question, the people that were on the ground, you know, when I started, they, they, they chant the Black Lives Matter slogans for sure. And they chant George Floyd's name, Breonna Taylor's name, much more toward the beginning. As the protests went on, there was less and less of that. It was more fuck the police. It was more, you know, Ted Wheeler wanted dead or alive. He's the mayor. Um, they still sloganeer for Black Lives Matter because I think it gives them a little legitimacy or cover, whatever you want to call it. I Maybe it's because I haven't seen, that, seen them build anything. I've only seen them break stuff. So I can't say, like, is this a political movement that has an agenda that they want to build something? Or is it just kids that are getting identity from, from messing stuff up? If they would build something, then maybe we would know. Yeah. Well, but, but part of, part of Marxist theory, and you saw this in the incredibly um, deadly approach that say someone like uh, Chairman Mao took during the cultural revolution, or certainly Pol Pot in Cambodia, yeah. there was, there was sort of a method to their madness because part of what they were doing was trying to break their culture's relationship with late stage capitalism, mm -hmm. which meant that they killed a lot of people. You know, uh, uh, Pol Pot killed the elites. He killed the academics. He forced people out of the cities into the country. And, and it, to, to an outsider that hasn't sort of read some of the, the more radical Marxist stuff, it, it seems like, um, he must just be a monster, but in their mind that there was a there was a logic to it I, we have to break it so that we can fix it and i i wonder if that's part of what's happening in portland and and frankly other cities i have a friend who who is trying to survive san francisco oh, in, boy. A, in a place near haight ashbury and her theory is that they actually want to destroy the city so that so that the capitalists leave you know anybody that has a job or an income and I hope that's not true, but it. I wonder if there's a method to the madness. Well, I can tell you, I have a lot of friends at San Francisco that have left. Sometimes I didn't even know they're just like, oh, we're living in Marin now. <laughs> like they just sold their house. You know, it's just like oh, we're done. We we got little kids, and we're we we're just not doing this anymore. You know, I I've been pretty. I don't know if it's critical of the press, but you know, it's a really small contingent of. Uh, people in Portland that are doing this and they've been allowed to dominate the narrative because most people are like, they're taking the kids to the soccer game or like they're going to work. Um, we have not seen, you know, they're not, they're, there's no mass killings in Portland yet. And, and I don't even know that that would be, I mean, at this stage, thank God that's not on the agenda. I do think they want to unseat the government for sure. They, they know, you know, Ted Wheeler used to, he's the mayor, used to be like their guy, right? Oh, they have no love for him or anyone on the city council. I think they do want to abolish city government, definitely want to get rid of the police. I mean, that, I mean, completely. Um, uh, yeah, I, but again, it's a small, it's a small group of people where it's going to go. I don't know because the local, the city and state governance has been really bad, has had a lot of failings, I think. And um, it's allowed this to carry on. One reason being is because they were so anti-Trump and I am myself not pro-Trump at all, but to make like, it, it's like he, he was so gigantic in their minds that they had to do everything against him, right? So, so like the mayor is making these terrible decisions only because he thinks Trump would be making a different decision. And I think it's led Portland, and I say this in the piece uh, in Reason, it's going to be in the May issue. Um, where do you go from here when you've made so many terrible decisions for your city and continue to? How do you, how do you fix it? Who yeah. do you invite into the room? Who do you trust to invite into the room to help you fix it? It's kind of, um, I mean, I, I have friends who, who still do business in, in Portland, Oregon, and, and they've tried to communicate with the mayor. Um, and like, I, I would imagine that there are people outside of his traditional, very progressive constituency, but like the mystery that you, you, you just described it, if it's such a small percentage of the population of the city, and I, I don't even imagine that a lot of these these kids dressed in black actually vote. Um, why is Ted Wheeler, the mayor of Portland, why is he held so hostage? He just survived. Didn't he just survive a, a primary challenge by the Antifa candidate? 
what what is he afraid of? And is wouldn't he be more afraid that the entire business community is going to say, screw it, I'm out of here? I think he, uh, Ted Wheeler painted himself into a corner. I uh, covered a story for Reason in um, spring of 2019 when the city council was voting to pass a resolution to ban hate groups in the city. Now, on its face, that sounds fine. Like, great. Like, wh who's pro hate groups, right? But the problem is, who defines what a hate group is? You know, you're in power right now, and so these people are the hate group, but now you're voted out, and now you've got this law in the books, and how are you going to use it? So they, they wouldn't define it. And it passed, you know, it passed with flying colors. And I think it was because the progressive, the more progressive elements wanted it and he wanted to make them happy, but you can't make them happy. They are just by definition, never going to be happy with what, well, first of all, progress doesn't stop, right? Even if it's devolution. And um, so he was their guy, he tried to make them happy and now they're unhappy but where does he go? He also has, um, he hired a DA. This was actually kind of funny. So the DA was the, that was existing was not supposed to leave until December, but there was an election and he lost to this young guy, um, Schmidt is his last name, I think. And the guy in July, the old DA said to him, Ugh, it's gonna be your problem, you take over now. So this DA walks in and he basically decriminalizes um, uh, any sort of, um, any sort of violence you do in the course of protesting. So there's no consequences for people. They just break windows, they haul them in, they take them out, they haul them in, they take it out. It's like, what? What? They can't fix it. He surrounded himself by people that are not going to make a stand towards fixing anything. Not that I can see. Yeah. But well, isn't, uh, isn't Antifa, they're, they're, didn't they chase Wheeler out of his own apartment yes. building? Yes. And and talk about that tactic where they go around neighborhoods and shine lights and yes. and all that stuff. So um, with Wheeler, that was, I think, September, August, something like that. They sat in front of his house. Then they sat in his lobby. And I've had them, you know, they've done this to me to intimidate me. You know, they get in your face and they scream at you. Blah, 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 blah. And um, they did it for several nights. They staged fires. Now, this is in the Pearl District. The Pearl District is like the nice, tony little area near downtown. And he was in a you know $900,000 condo. And they set fires in the street and they danced around it. And uh, he decided to move out because he didn't want to he didn't want to um, annoy his neighbors anymore. Well, that was considerate, except you're the fucking mayor. OK, how is this leadership to say, OK, I'll move out of my condo? So he did. I um I was actually in Portland, I think, if not the first night, one of the first nights, you know, you have to you have to escalate the tactics. You don't just do the same thing every night. Though my God, it's so boring. I, I'm like, guys, kids, can you get some new moves? It's like bust a window, set a fire. It's like, God, this is aren't you bored yet? But I was with them one of the nights they're marching through the streets. It's it wasn't actually that late, it was like nine o'clock, but it was dark. And they're marching through the streets, and it's weird because it's dark, it's unlit, it's residential, they're all in black. They almost look like a bunch of like, like a little army, right? And they were not making much noise. And there are people on their, they're clapping for them on their stoop with their little kids, you know, because they want to support the young people, right? They want, and as this is happening, somebody shouts to them, this used to be a black neighborhood, you know, gentrifier, gentrifier, pants on fire, blah, whatever. And it's like, and the people are just like, uh, 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 uh. Well, then it escalated from there. You, um, you, you shine lights at midnight and you shout, what a shout, you know, get up, get up, get up, motherfucker, get up. And I asked one of the women, a lot of women, this movement, I would say maybe more women than men or definitely equal number. And I was like, what do you, do you actually expect them to get up and march with you? She's like, no, 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 no. They're living their comfortable lives and they have to understand that there are people that are not comfortable and we want to make them uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was not. And I'll, I'll tell a little story that I've told before. So when I was living there in 2019, I had my ex, my daughter's dad was living with my husband and me. He had stage four cancer. He was dying. He did die. And I got to tell you. If they had come and shown lights in his window at midnight shouting that, I would not have been too happy Yeah. about that. But, you know, people are scared. They're intimidated. Of course they are. You've got 600 people in black helmets 
screaming at you. You know, some people will will get up in their faces. Not many. Not many. They're they're intimidated. And I've talked to a lot of people who are like, well, I didn't want to say anything. I don't I'm I don't support this, but I know if I say something, I'm gonna get, you know, holy hell rain down on me from my neighbors, or maybe they're gonna come back, maybe they're gonna come to my house. And so people don't say anything. But I don't know. I, I don't know how long people are gonna put up with I mean, people have left. I have a friend there who's an entrepreneur, she's opened a bunch of businesses and she said, you know, Nancy, we're losing our um our intellectual capital. People are just like, fuck it. Yeah. She's like, you left. I'm like, yeah, my husband closed his business. He's not there anymore. Just gone. Like, I, I don't want to, this is not the environment. I feel like we can do our best work in. So bye. Talk about the, the and I think it's, it's related because it's this, it's this culture of intolerance that you describe in, in your piece about, about how that evolved in Portland. But if you would tell the story about, about, how your work made your husband's yeah. business a target because I yeah. think I think that helps explain why people won't speak up because it's it's dangerous to your livelihood. It might actually be dangerous to your person to push back. Yeah. So um uh, late 2018, early 2019, I had a podcast that only lasted for five episodes with a gal named Leah McSweeney. She's now a real housewife of New York, which is hilarious, but she was a journalist at the time, had a sports uh, a clothing company. And um, we had a little uh, uh, podcast, hashtag me neither, which Matt Welch named. So he gets all the blame credit. Um, and we talked about trying to. He, he's a monster. He's a monster. He's just a fact. monster. Ugh. Um, Anyway, we, we talked about trying to have some clarity. With, you know, Me Too, Too was raging. And we we're like, look, you know, for, for anything, for the good that is coming out, you also have the bad. I mean, this is inevitable with anything, right? Um, like you could have great frozen yogurt and shitty frozen yogurt. It's, it's just inevitable. And we, we wanted to try to say, look, there's a difference between a Harvey Weinstein, or not even Harvey Weinstein, with, a, with an R. Kelly and an Aziz Ansari. And if you don't see that, you are not ever going to solve anything. So we talked about that. We talked about um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. We talked about, you know, how we'd both been victims of sexual assault. It's like, you know, how long do you carry this around? How long do you let it define you? Um, we talked about the rot at the top of the women's march. You know, they were anti-Semitic and in like we were talking about things that I don't think it's so unusual, but maybe it wasn't popular. Let's put it that way. Okay, but we were having fun. We videoed it. We we're both girls flipping our hair around, just being goofballs. And a former employee, manager of my husband's business, he was a coffee roaster and had a bunch of cafes. She had been the hiring manager and she was kind of like a mother hen to a lot of employees, but she left not under great circumstances. She and my husband didn't get along anymore. She decided that my uh, podcast um, put the employees of Ristretto Roasters, that was the company, in physical danger physical danger. And she got some former and I guess current staff to um, sign a letter claiming they felt this way and unsafe. And by extension, the community of Portland was unsafe and they sent it to the media and the Portland media, they ate it up like creme brulee, baby. It was like, absolutely, you know, look at the monstrous people. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'd had a, I'm gonna plug my book to the bridge, a true story of motherhood and murder. It had come out six months before I'd been on the covers of all the magazines. I'd been, you know, like I was known. Well, that's fun. You know, you don't, you don't bring down people that are like Joe Schmo, right? You want to, have some fun with this, I guess. Anyway, um, uh, people, all the wholesale customers fled. People didn't come to the cafes. The employees all quit. I had to work the cash register with my husband, which is like, what? Just to sort of, and he was baristaing, which he hadn't done in, you know, since he'd opened the business 10 years before. And um, basically just attrition, 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 closed the, most of the cafes, had one cafe left open, still did the coffee, had one employee from 35 employees to one employee, his nephew, and then the last cafe um, closed during COVID because it was in an office building. And um, basically, he shut down the business for good in November. And we sold our house and we're out. And um, yeah, I during that time, so when it, it's obviously a scary thing. It's uh, and and I, you know, he had nothing to do with it. You know, it was like, and it, the the funny thing, well, not funny, it was like he had all these people. It's like you better you better leave your fucking wife or lose your business. Like, oh, nice, nice nice feminists here. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah. but, um, I, about six days into the barrel, I get an email from a woman and she said, hi, Nancy, my name is Heather Hying. You don't know me, 
But my husband, Brett Weinstein, and I have sort of gone through in a different context what you have. I'm living here in Portland. I'd like to extend my hands. I don't want to start crying now, but I'm going to. I'm like, actually, Heather, I do know who you are. I know exactly who you are. And we met and she um, she told me what was going to happen. Everything she said was going to happen happened. And she said something I've repeated many times. And, and I think that people watching this can can remember it for when it happens to them or to be a better citizen. She said, um, when these things happen, uh, a few people stand by you publicly. Matt Welch was one that did. Heather was, Barry Weiss, my friends. A few more privately, and the bulk of people sit on the fence and wait to see which way the wind blows. So if I could just say, like, we also, though, amazingly, you meet the most incredible people who you've never met, who, like, hold out their hands to you and bring you meatloaf and bourbon. And, like, they are like, we are here. And And this is something I think it's a good thing to do for people in general. Like it's a, it's a tough thing. Don't worry. You, you know, you think people, I think people think your shame is going to splash onto them and maybe it will, but you know what? It also won't. If we just say, no, no, I'm not going to participate in this. I'm going to, I'm going to do a better job. So that's the story. <laughs> yeah. And you, um, it, you know, the accusation was boiled down and this is, I mean, this is definitely what happened to Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein is, the accusation was that since you weren't 100% with them, you were, um, uh, in this case, rape culture, or however yes. they would say rape that. Rape, rape culture apologist. Which, you know what's really funny, Matt? I realize um, what they hit you with is always stuff that would make you upset because you know it's not true, like Brett and racism, me and being like anti-women, like, or pro-rape, like, because they can't accuse you of like, like, oh, you're not a good javelin thrower. I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Like, I'm not. I'm like, who cares? Yeah. They hit you where it hurts and they hit you where it's going to get the most attention. And look, I, I can't tell you if there was a percentage of people that were actually frightened of me. I, I would think that would be pretty absurd, but, you know, what do I know? And, you know, the, ac the accusation in the streets is if you're not with Antifa, you must be a fascist and there's no there's no Absolutely. middle ground there you're either a fascist or you know and what they're not saying is you're either a fascist fascist or you're a marxist but it's it's always that black and white us versus them kind of thing yeah i, I was called a fash for sure you're a fash i'm like i i am <laughs> no i'm not i'm just a journalist <laughs> you know um yeah i mean i find this so reductive and stupid it's like you don't know me and if i mean i will say what something I, i've also said before like one-on-one -on -one, i've had a lot of conversations with the patriot prayer guys they're like a pro-trump or right-wing group from uh, vancouver i've had antifa girls wash the tear gas out of my eyes i've had i think it was a proud boy did this i mean my, no patriot prayer guy did the same thing one-on-one -on -one, all put on our pants one leg at a time most people will sit and have a conversation with you which is of course the only way Kind of why we're here like the only way we move forward at all but as a group yeah they, they're just going to paint you because because that they need enemies that's how they get their calories that's how they get their energy right yeah. You, you, so yeah they need enemies they need to make more and more enemies which is why we see more and more like oh you're not you know whatever it is today you know you're you be accused of this it's, it's dr seuss now right because we've got to find more and more things to be angry about to sustain our our momentum in this movement yeah and if they don't have a real enemy they they create one that sure i think i think that was uh leninism 101 and i'm not talking about john um, <laughs> so you um you, you mentioned this and i want i want to go back to it you you've been reporting on antifa and um, they did they know who you were? Um, and so did they target you in rallies like they targeted anti and and Andy no? Um, not as much. I'm not, you know, he he's public enemy number one there in Portland. Um, but he's also, you know, he he's um you know, he's he's made Antifa his public en enemy number one. So, you know, it's a mutual sort of antagonism. I basically, you know, I'm there with a pad and a tape recorder or my, my phone, but they do know who I was. They knew I was because they knew me from the whole thing with my husband and yeah. I have pink hair or blue hair, whatever color it was. And, um, yeah, I got, um, I had my phone stolen. Um, I got screamed in my face. I had a guy say he was going to beat the shit out of me with a bat. 
Um, they make, they kind of like shadow you sometimes. They put my picture online, which is hilarious. They're always like, you can't, photography equals death. You can't take any pictures. And I'm like, then they're putting my picture online. I'm like, Gee, what are the other guys? Like, what's it going to be? Um, but you know what? I got to tell you, I never felt scared because most of these people, the guy that said he was going to hit me with the metal baton was not pleasant, but he was, I don't think he was really anti. I think he was just a wing nut. I was never scared. I'm like, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me? No, you're not going to. Um, and really, one-on-one, -on -one, they're not very courageous people, not in my experience. And that's okay. And actually, I had a long conversation. She, she actually did talk on the record. Super nice girl, works as a dog walker. You know, like, does, like she's, like, nice. Like, they will talk to you. But, yeah, in a group, they like to see if they can intimidate you. I wasn't, I wasn't intimidated. Sorry. Yeah, I like the. I always, I always wondered, uh, and I asked one of my progressive friends about this, um, maybe on this show or some other show. Like, how courageous can you be if you're wearing a mask to a protest? This is not Hong Kong. You don't have the central government uh, sweeping you up and taking you to re-education camps. You're hiding your face because because you're afraid and you're sort of hiding in this uniform that everyone looks the same. It, it seems like a, a very tribal but cowardly sort of community. I think there's a real correlation between, um, you know, staying anonymous online, right? You know, the, peop the things that people have said, I'm sure to you, and they've said to me are sometimes beyond grotesque. Um, they wouldn't do it with their name attached. And I think that if you're showing your face um, you're not going to be smashing things the way you do when you can do it anonymously. I do wonder, you know, you're 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 drawing a lot of correlations between, you know, Pol Pot and you know Stalin and stuff. I, I have not read as deeply as you have for sure, but I wonder if the sort of you know this younger internet generation who grew up with um, anonymity and saying you know smearing people online, um, if it's very easy for them to fall into the uh, to it's it's what they do anyway to yeah. fall into the um to the costume. Interesting. I, I'm a, I'm afraid that might be true, and it kind of gets back to like I've I've been sort of a, um, pretty radical in opposition to lockdowns, even even early on because of the unintended consequences of all this. But one that I didn't really imagine because I never imagined that lockdowns would go on this long is the dehumanization of this whole process. Like, you know, we're locked in our homes and and we're we're getting more and more angry and we hide our faces and we we judge people even though we have no idea if they did anything wrong. And that on top of that, that sort of anonymous culture, like you, you say things to people online that you would never say to them never. to their face. It's sort of like driving in your car and the guy cuts you off. <laughs> <laughs> the things that you say about that guy are not something that you would ever say to him okay. if you were actually looking him in the eye. And this the, the dehumanization, going back to, to Pol Pot and, and Mao and Stalin, like dehumanization is a key part of how authoritarians um, do this stuff to otherwise decent people. And I, I, I worry about it. I, I don't like drawing analogies to, to mass murderers, but I, I worry about where we're headed with this stuff. Well, I, I do. I'm, I'm sorry to plug it for the third time, but I, I am pleased with how um, the piece came out, uh, the new the new piece in Reason about Portland. And one thing I say at the end, and it, and it really is kind of heartbreaking, you know, they've become mesmerized by the nihilistic fire. And these are young people. And it's like, young people, please go make out, you know, go, you know, whatever, go fuck around, go dance. And maybe, maybe it's because they didn't have these opportunities. Like you're saying, like this lockdown, you can't go out, you can't go to a movie. You can't, I don't know, have sex with someone you never met or whatever it is that you want to say the joy, the allowable joys got sapped. And so they had to find another thing, but do not let yourself be mesmerized by that nihilistic fire. This is a bad idea. You've got to look toward, toward the light and, 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 you know, for some sort of um, hope and glow. And I, and I, I almost, I see them robbing themselves of hope. There's no, I mean, all it is, is about destruction. Fuck the police, you know, kill Ted Wheeler. They don't say that, but they, they, well, they say fuck him and they've got, you know, wanted dead or alive posters and they're, they say that they're fighting for justice, but 
What is justice? What are they fighting for? Do you know? No idea. No idea. And you know, they're very young too. Oh man, Matt. I, I mean, some of these, these they're so young. I, I, these two kids that screamed in my face, photography equals death. And I was like, oh, hold on. Hi, hi guys. I want to, I want to unpack this with you. So what do you mean by that? No, no, just tell me like a, 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 and they just walked away. They don't, they, they, they know a slogan and that is as far as they can go. And that's just like, oh, guys, just like, I don't know, go home, make some cookies, go watch TV, do something else, because this is not, I, I don't know how it's enriching them. I, I don't, I don't think it is. I'm sure I would love to talk to somebody that could say to me, it is enriching me. And here's why. And here where I think we're getting. And here's how I think it's going to be positive for not just me and my ilk, but for the community and for the world at large. I would love to have that conversation. So what's um so like you you've written about this for and has this recent piece come out yet? I don't know when the May issue comes no, out. No, it's a it'll be it'll be online and think in about a week or two. Um okay. and um it it's um it's a, in a way uh it's sort of like the piece you started out with the tablet piece but updated to include, you know, everything that's happened and because things have happened. Portland has evolved pretty fast uh since 2019. Um the city the city is not looking good. The city, I mean, the homelessness and the encampments and the destruction downtown and the business that closed during COVID and the constant destruction, like physical destruction, if not every night now, but it's, um, the city does not look, it, you started this by saying it's such a beautiful city. Right now, it, it's not all of it. It's still, you know, Portland, planet of the plants, but um, a lot of it is not beautiful anymore. Yeah, I, I was there in December and I went to the, the the war zone, and it's no, it's not beautiful anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would always go out of my way to stay. In fact, I was at that shop that you described getting smashed um, when I was there in December, I think. And I used to stay at the uh, Ace Hotel all the time, yep. and it yep. just, I just love the whole scene. And yep. I, I won't, I won't go there anymore. If I have to go to Portland on business, I'll do my business, and then I'll. I'll stay out in the country somewhere because it's just not, it's not worth it. No. And let's see when it will be. Um, I mean, I don't know who wants to live in ugliness, who wants to live in broken glass. That, I mean, if that's a reflection of, of what they're feeling inside, that's pretty sad, yeah. you know? But, so. but I'm hoping that you, so, so you've told us this devastatingly dark <laughs> evolution from beautiful Portland to Portlandia to um, hellhole. Yeah, I guess we're not allowed to say shithole anymore, but <laughs> he ruined uh, that ruined that phrase for us. What's what's the solution? Like, how how do we keep? How do I? I, I can't say my town because I live in Washington D.C. and I'm I'm actually almost literally surrounded by barbed wire right now. So oh man, but uh, what 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 should we do? I mean, one thing is to engage young people. I think with with ideas and values and hope, but. What can we do to stop this from happening to all of our cities? Well, I do. Um, I do a every Monday, five p.m. Eastern time. I I host a clubhouse with a couple of other journalists. So it was a pretty with Katie Herzog last now last night and and Lizzie Wolf from Reason. And one of the questions we got was, "Where do you all think we are in the evolution? If you want to call it cancel culture, where like are we beginning, middle, or end?" And I think that, and I am going to, I am going to draw a parallel with Portland, um, and, but I invite your peoples to the clubhouse. Come do, come join us. Um, I think we're in the middle going through a little more. And what I think the solution is, is not just to create organizations where you're going to fight it. It's to create new beauty, to create things that are like, okay, I could like be a canceler or I could fight cancel culture. Or I can go over here and make a pie. And like, maybe some people are gonna be like, oh, look, pie. That's the name of my Substack. make more pie. So you can go over there too. So in terms of Portland, what could happen? Well, I think people, if there were other things to do, I think they'd get tired of coming out every night. Be like, eh, I wanna stay home and watch Netflix and chill. I wanna, uh, you know, school's back in session or I've got another job. So maybe some people that didn't have things to do now that COVID is opening up, maybe they'll, absorb back into where they were. I also think that, you know, 
probably every city in the history of cities has had a, um, you know, a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall. Sure, we've had destruction. Businesses have left. Things have closed. But inevitably, spring will come again and it will be a new city built, you know, now maybe it's going to be affordable again. So you're going to have a whole wave of people that are going to come in and say, oh, I can do what people were doing in 2004. I'm the eternal optimist. So I, I think that that's inevitable. How long it takes? I don't know. And I'm not going to be there to be part of it. We sold our house. So. Yeah. So I'm told that, that Zoomers are sort of the um, counter revolution in cancel culture. I hope that's true. Um, and it, it sort of makes sense that whatever the older generation is doing, you might do the opposite, but sort of the authoritarianism and intolerance of cancel culture. Um, it strikes me that places like clubhouse, um, I've spent some time on clubhouse too, and it's, it is a place where you actually have to speak to people yep. and you're, and you, you're supposed to use your real name. You're not and, anonymous. You, yeah. You're not anonymous you know. and you're having a conversation and I, I still, I've always been sort of a romantic about social media and I've been proven horribly wrong in the last couple of years, but it strikes me that the counter revolution is, is long form conversation and curiosity and, and a, a, not only a tolerance, but an excitement about hearing people yeah. from different perspectives. And, and I, I think we're both working towards that and, and hoping that that's true. And, and I, I, I gotta believe that my 16 year old self would hate cancel culture with a burning passion because that's who 16 year olds are. Yeah. Um, I think we are, you know, clubhouse, which I really wasn't very interested in until about a month ago when I joined. And now I, re I really, I, I'm, I really only go on it when I'm kind of running something I've popped in a few times, but it's very intimate. Um, the voices are intimate and you're really sort of thinking and you have to like wait your turn. And, um, We've created, you know, for, for all the horrors of COVID, we've created new mediums um, in which to communicate, whether it's Clubhouse or Substack or Matt Welch, horrible monster Matt Welch, and I built a little studio, Paloma Media, we're podcasting out of there with the Fifth Column guys, and it's like, it's fun. And I think, I know people are angry, they want to break shit, but people really also want to have fun. And um, so let's give them some fun. And um, I, I, it can't hurt. <laughs> let's 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 uh if if you're up for it let's do a clubhouse sometime on let's these subjects it. i'd love it i'd love it um, yeah we created something called club liberty and i'm hoping that um my, my whole goal is to just platform as many interesting people as possible and and have voices and and create sort of environment lead by example i guess is how i think about it just show your willingness to talk to people from different perspectives and maybe other people will say, oh, that that's actually kind of cool. I, I want to do that now, too. So I'm hoping that Clubhouse becomes that it is. It kind of is now. And I hope it doesn't become another place where everyone cancels everybody else. Well, it you know, it is they're they're calling out people. It's inevitable. It'll be a cycle. And then but then we'll build something else, you know, and then we just keep, you know. Yeah, I, I think it'll be fine for a while. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, so so do some blatant self-promotion here. You you mentioned one of your books, um, but you said it so fast, I don't think anyone heard it. Sure. So tell me about where we get more Nancy. More Nancy. Um, well, my website 24 is 24 24-7. 7 man. I got a lot of platforms these days. So Nancy Rom, N-A-N-C-Y-R-O-M-M -M, on Twitter, or that's also my website. Um, my book is called To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder, about a woman that threw her two young children off a bridge in Portland, Oregon. It is not... A sensational book. It is a book about trying to understand what people say is not understandable. I, I don't accept that. I think that we 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 can look at these things that are hard and, and learn some things. Um, at Paloma Media, also on Twitter, and we've got a YouTube channel. Matt and I are putting up some work there. I've got a Substack. Put my name into Substack. Um, and Clubhouse, 5 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. So yeah, and I'm writing for Newsweek, uh, The Dispatch, Reason. The Wall Street Journal. Yeah, I'm easy to find. Matt, if anyone says they can't find me, they are not looking. Yeah. So. <laughs> so um, how do you do all that, by the way? 
I, I need some lessons on how to well, be that productive. Well, so my life has changed radically. Like I lived with a husband and family and a million people in and out of the house. I'm living by myself in Chinatown right now. So I've got, you know, I've got time to work. And I also, I love what I'm writing about. I mean, Catherine Mangu Ward, at the editor-in-chief of Reason, when I, I texted her on a Sunday morning and said, I want to get out to Portland for you. She said, go. I mean, people are, I, I you know, covering the Portland story. I've been covering the the Donald McNeil Jr. story um, at the New York Times. I'm just, I'm very fortunate that people want me to write for them and I'm just, just doing it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. And then let's do, let's do more stuff. Sounds great. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.